Okay, good morning. We're going to start our meeting. Tuesday, June 12th, uh, edition of the Board of Fair Commissioners meeting. And as usual, we start each meeting with a legal notice. As information for our audience, if you're not satisfied with the decision made by the Metropolitan Board of Fair Commissioners today, you may appeal the decision by petitioning for a writ of cert with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of entry of the board's decision. To ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been met, please be advised that you should contact your own independent legal counsel. All right, our meeting is called to order. First uh, agenda item is to review the minutes from our previous meeting, which was May 8th, and those minutes have been circulated. I'll move to approve. Second. Motion is made to approve. It's been seconded. Are there any comments or questions on the minutes as presented? If not, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the minutes have been approved. We have one commissioner that we know is going to be slightly late, um, so we're carrying on, but we will uh, move into public comment time, and uh, our process, I did, mm -hmm. it was so exciting that, <laughs> um, three minutes, limit your comments to three minutes, you uh, can step to the podium and please identify yourself and your address, please. Good morning, my name is Shane Smiley, Brush Hill Road, Nashville. For months we've been hearing about how we can't run the race haulers through the construction site, how that's an OSHA violation, how that's an insurance violation. Tried to find a way to be able to get the haulers in and out without running them up and down the hill, which puts their equipment in harm's way, is actually harming some of their equipment with dragging. Uh, talk to Jonathan about it multiple times, but it always comes down to we can't do it because of OSHA regulations, safety concerns, and insurance. That would be all well and good if he lived up to that all the way around. But on May 25th, you got the pictures before you, during the active flea market, Jonathan allowed a loaded cement truck to come through the gates that say no vehicles beyond this point and to run through the active flea market on Friday afternoon, midday. Now, if we're so concerned about OSHA and insurance and safety of everyone, how was that allowed to happen? So I'm hoping that you'll do something about that. That it, it appears that everything this said about safety and his concerns only pertain to what's going on down there. But when it comes to the people that utilize this property, their actions are careless. And everybody that sees those pictures and see how close senior citizens are to that cement truck coming through must acknowledge that their actions were careless. And I hope as this board will do something about it. Your vote that you're going to take today on this new master plan, it took a whole two weeks to come up with. The wrestlers against it, the flea market vendors are against it. Every promoter that I know of that utilizes this hill is against it. You guys are supposed to be the fair board. Quit trying to act like the soccer board and work for the fairgrounds. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Public comment time? Thank you, board. Point. At this point, I'd like to be well and clear. Sorry, we say your name. The say fact your name, that, uh, first off, I'm Wanda West. I am the uh, 
Secretary of Treasury working with Dick Dickerson of the original Flea Market Vendors Association that's been recognized in this community by our flea market group and buyers for a long time. At this point, I want to bring forth to the board documentation and ask that, first off, we are a recognized group. We have established a 501c non-for-profit. We are number one, the um, Tennessee Fairgrounds Flea Market Association, and we are also recognized as the Nashville Flea Market Association. I ask that you review these documents and return them to me for the purpose of any other people who are not part of our group by membership in long-term standing as vendors at our flea market no longer come before your board and address that they are thus and so, nor go before our Metro Council. That's what I ask. One moment. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Virginia Russell, 2718 Overhill, Donaldson, Tennessee. I have been coming to this fairgrounds to see the fair since the late 40s, which is a lot older than many of you sitting in front of me. I am very concerned that this fairgrounds is going to be torn down and put in a tiny corner so that a soccer field can come in, which we will end up having to pay more taxes on. And I'm sorry, but we're already being hit with more taxes. And I don't plan to leave here, but I find it disappointing that all the activities that go on on this fairgrounds throughout the year will greatly be hampered. And it's not just the flea market. You've got Christmas Village. You've got uh, various other groups, the perennial plant sale that come in here. It's a wide range. And I think it's time that we pay attention to what the citizens voted on a few years ago, which was keeping the fairgrounds here. And I mean, you don't remember when the women's building burned here. I was a child and I used to love to come here to the state fair. And to think you're gonna tear down all these buildings just to add another sports arena. If you can't put it in the smaller area or down in that far from standing right here, lower right corner, then I think you need to relook at the whole thing because those long timers and a lot of us new timers would like to see the organizations that have been functioning here all these years and would like to continue having new functions here be able to be here. It was appalling to me when I heard in the news recently that some of the funds that were earmarked to update some of the buildings here had been sent over to the sports group that was going to be coming in here. Nobody actually up and said, oh, I did it by mistake or, or we just did it. That's wrong. It's time the people are heard. It's time you pay attention to what the concerns are of this total Nashville community. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, Rick Williams, 120 Winthorpe Drive, Old Hickory. Uh, I want to address the board this morning. I know you've got on your agenda about a master plan. Uh, I do not know this lady that spoke. I've never seen her before in my life, but I want to echo her sentiments. I hope you'll listen to the citizens of Nashville. Uh, there's a, you're trying to rush this soccer stadium through. And I hate we're spending money on a proposed soccer stadium doing anything when you don't have the votes necessary at the council to tear the buildings down. It's obvious. We know it. They know it. They don't have 27 votes to tear the buildings down. Maybe there's something I don't know, but I'm telling you it's not there. But we continue to spend taxpayer money on going forward with a soccer stadium. You've got this reimagined 
fairgrounds proposal this morning put together in about a month how do you really study the ideas and proposal and do it in a month I submit this proposal has been around for probably six months and was probably shown to the MLS League in New York back in December. It's just we're getting to see it today for the first time. So I hope you really consider what you're doing today. You're, you're taking and not listening to the citizens again. Thank you. I'm Ann McKinney with Christmas Village, and I wasn't going to speak today, but I feel like all these people are speaking on our behalf without really verbalizing our opinions. And I've been very involved with all of the workshops that you had, and I feel like you've done a really good job of listening to the majority of the people that are stakeholders. And for us, quite honestly, the new Expo Center is going to be a huge benefit for us. We would have rather had one building, but two that we can connect will be great for our vendors. And I feel like you're going to make sure that the timing is going to work so that we can always have a show in November and you're building the buildings down there before you tear any down. So I want to thank you for listening for the input. I'm George Gruen. I live at 915 Old Lebanon Dirt Road in Hermitage. And my business, Gruen Guitars, is at 2120. 8th Avenue South. Um, I've said it before and I'll say it again at the time for public comment at the beginning of a meeting before we've heard any of the reports is I think backwards. It used to be that they did it at the end of the meeting after everybody had listened but already voted which was also wrong. The right time for public comment would be bef after the comment the proposals have been made and before you vote on them, if you really care what we have to say. Um, I listened to what Wanda West had to say, and there is, of course, another Fairgrounds Vendors Flea Market Association that is also a 501c3. I spoke at some length, and I've known Dick Dickerson many times, I've spoken with him at length, and he admits that they really haven't had any votes in his group to go beyond their own executive committee. So far as a real vendor's vote where they've done a survey of the hundreds of vendors there, that's never happened. And Wanda West admitted that to me as well. So I don't, I don't, I take exception to her saying that hers is the only legitimate group to represent vendors. In looking at the agenda, I am concerned in new business about what do they mean by merchandise and display policy. If it means to prohibit people from renting a booth and putting up literature that may oppose the MLS, that would be a First Amendment lawsuit violation type issue. And uh, in Tennessee right now, at Montgomery Bell State Park, the KKK and the White Lives Matters group is visiting. I don't like them, but the state has a policy that they must rent to them whether they like it or not. As long as they're not violent, they can't prohibit people from renting a facility and stating their mind. And much the same should be true of any group it is a, it, if they rent a booth and want to put out their literature or t-shirts or such, they should be able to do that legally. Uh, the funding resolution for the, the passed through the council uh, regarding MLS funding was done with one resolution for funding, no public hearing, no public comment permitted, and without getting the necessary, no three readings. It, it, it didn't get the attention that if somebody had a house with a half acre of land and wanted to rezone it, that would require three readings and a public hearing. The spirit of the referendum that passed by 72% regarding saving the fairgrounds and preserving its functions 
whether you can find loopholes around it or not, the spirit of it is clear. And if you ignore the spirit as well as the letter of what passed by 72% of the public that voted, if you ignore that, there will be consequences legally and at the next round of metro elections. So Thank I you, Mr. You Green. Consider that with care. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and the members of the board. My name is Steve Ryder, R E I T E R for the record. Uh, my position on the master plan is pretty clear. I don't believe it's in compliance with the charter. <clears throat> and the reason I say that is because the charter refers to existing uses that are there. Also, specifically, the charter specifies that you have to put on a fair. And to give you an example of that, in 2011, the fair operator basically had a gate-to-gate -gate lease, gave him over 100 acres of this property to use for the benefit of putting on a fair. Given what you're proposing, or what's before you today, is something that is going to restrict the ability to put on a successful fair. And I don't believe that's in compliance with the Charter. Furthermore, you can't change the Charter. Your role is basically as of a landlord. That's it. The Charter governs the use of this property. And the Charter, I think, is pretty clear that you have to put on a fair. Furthermore, I believe that if somebody petitions for relief to a court, I think they will prevail. Furthermore, I think that they could put this property into receivership. And the reason I say that is because a receiver would go out to make sure that they would have this property operate in compliance with the charter. Because that's what your job is. And frankly, I don't know that you're doing that. You have a fiduciary responsibility to that charter. The Metro Council can't change that charter, not through resolution, not through charter. The only thing that can change that charter is another charter amendment. You are not proceeding down that road. And since you're not proceeding down that road, it means that to me it sounds like you're ignoring what the charter says. And I don't believe you have the right to do that. Thank you so much. Anybody else wish to be recognized during this public comment time? Okay, if not, we will move on to some monthly reports. Uh, one thing the staff is in transition. Um, we are in the process of making a, a hire, replacing a position, um, and maybe our executive director can comment on that. I can. As far as the financial update, we are going to um, have a more complete uh, financial update in July. Um, as you know, we've had a vacancy for approximately five weeks in our finance position, as well as our assistant director has been out for, for some time. So we are a little um, understaffed administratively at this moment. So we have... Um, we had approximately, I think, 74 applications for our finance and administrative manager. About 54 of them met minimums. So we had um, a tremendous response to our advertising and very, very highly qualified candidates. To date, we have finished um, phone interviews. We hope to narrow that down to a short list that moves on to face-to-face -face personal interviews next week. And hopefully by the end of next week, we will have made a decision um, on that position. So hopefully sometime in July, we will have a new uh, finance and administrative manager. That said, and I'm not sure if she is Oh, is she here? Grace? I wanted to introduce Grace 
Grace, can you stand up, everybody? This is Grace, and Grace is a, she is a graduate student at East Tennessee, and she's graduating in December. She is getting her master's in accounting, and she has been gracious enough to um, accept an internship here with us and uh, kind of cover our accounting and finance functions until we get uh, that position replaced. And so it's a win-win for both of us with, with Grace uh, helping us out. So welcome, Grace. And then we also put them on the spot, Nicole and Ron Darius. Are you both here? Go ahead and stand up. <laughs> These are our two Opportunity Now interns. We started this program with Metro last year, and uh, Ron Darius is working over in our flea market office, and Nicole is helping us at administration doing, um, helping Scott with events and, and social media, et cetera. So welcome to both of you, and we'll have them for about six weeks. Welcome. Uh, I do, <clears throat> we're going to get into the um, public engagement recommendations, but I did want to mention that we have received a draft report from Nashville Civic Design Center. It's just a recap report, narrative of all of the meetings that we held for the public engagement. It's not finalized yet, so I did not um, have that prepared for you for review, but we will get that out to you as soon as they have a chance to finalize that report. Uh, Gary uh, sends his regrets that he was unable to attend today, Gary Gaston. He also has a board meeting this morning uh, that he needed to attend. So we will get that updated for you. Um, I think I would be remiss if I didn't mention some of the uh, incidents that we've had recently uh, since last meeting. Um, I'm sure everybody has kind of seen in the paper some very unfortunate incidents that occurred um, that have become such a distraction to, to our planning and to our community engagement process. And, you know, we are committed to listening to everyone. Um, it's not what they say, it's how they say it, and uh, very much so will not tolerate intimidation or bullying as we go through this process, keeping you know, respect for everyone's opinions as we move forward. So I just kind of wanted to, to throw that out there and, and say that publicly is, is it was taken very, very seriously, those incidents, and it's unacceptable. Okay, we're gonna move on to Fairgrounds Improvement Project Update, please. Um, that's your new business. I think Jonathan? Yeah, Jonathan's here. Good morning, Fair Board. How are you guys doing? morning. I uh, just want to run through a, a list of updates for the, the current projects we have going on for Fair Park and the racetrack grandstand improvements. Uh, the Fair, Fair Park is coming along well. The restroom building, our roof is complete. Uh, this past Wednesday we passed our electrical inspection and uh, we're ready for NES to connect the service. Uh, the north fields, uh, all the well, across the entire site, all of our rain gardens are nearing completion. All of the under drains uh, that were specified by Metro Stormwater are in place. Uh, the only one that's lagging behind is the one near Bridge One. Um, our fiber mix is currently being tilled into the dirt in north in the north field. Um, the sprigging is scheduled to start uh, middle of this month, so that'll be around next week, hopefully. Um, as far as all of our site work, all of our stormwater lines are complete. Uh, the dog park and east road sidewalks are in progress. Um, and the east sidewalk is actually scheduled to be complete tomorrow or by the end of the week, I hope. Um, all the binder course for the roads is complete. And, um, and all, a lot of the site, site lighting is complete as well. Um, we've had 75 weather impact days, but we are still on schedule to complete middle of December. That will be except for the Voters Island. Voters Island, again, is the 
small patch of land that surrounds the voters building. Um, the date that we've been given at this point that they will, the voting commission will be out of that building and have all the voting machines out of it is uh, the beginning of August and we're scheduled to demo that building August 17th. Um, and so then the voters island is scheduled to then be complete in February. I will mention that no buildings will be demolished unless it goes to council for approval. Correct. And well, that's correct. And I believe that the voters building was in uh, the first, when we got approval for our first demo. It, I may or may not be wrong, but if that's not the case, obviously we'll have to so. go back. Um, with the racetrack uh, renovations, the north and south walls, uh, all the paint prep and point up is complete. Uh, the north restroom block renovations are well underway and will be complete by the sixth race. So we'll have one bay of restrooms that are completely renovated. At that point time, they'll switch and go to the south restroom bays. Um, the concourse primer coat uh, started yesterday. Uh, the plan is to complete all of the concourse work, which includes paint, lights, and restrooms before the state fair. Um, and then all work underneath the canopy section uh, is to commence just after the last race because there will be a large scaffold system that is put up uh, to get that work done. Um, so other than that, everything is, is going well. And um, if you have any brief questions, I can address them. Or Quick question, Chairman. Uh, John, the, just looking at the pro, uh, fairgrounds improvement project, uh, kind of spreadsheet and funds that associated with that. And it uh, seem, doesn't seem like there's a lot of funds that have gone out compared to the work that's been done. Okay, I'm just Caleb, it's a cash flow. In, any, any questions about the, the funds or the budget are going to have to go through through Ed Henley. Okay. All right. Um, but I, I do want to address the safety concerns. Uh, we've had a lot of conversation. I've, I've talked um, with several people about trying to get the, the most efficient and safe way to get uh, – uh, brace teams and their, their trailers and onto the site. We've communicated with the fairground staff and the Speedway staff and uh, provided multiple ways for them to get in and also let them know that if they communicate ahead of time about when somebody's going to need to come through the site, if that's communicated out ahead of time, that we can hopefully accommodate and get someone through the site so they're not having to go from come from the top of the hill or come and just park in the back pit area. So we've been trying to do our best, saying that if you just will let us know exactly when and where you're going to come through the site, that we potentially can get you through there. So it's not, it hasn't been just this stone wall of, oh no, these are the rules and you can't come through the site at all. We've, we are following the rules. We put up a temporary fence that is opened at 2 p.m. before every single race day or race weekend on Friday, which then allows them to free flow from Craighead. And when that fence is not up, you can't just have unauthorized vehicles coming on site. And there's signs posted at every entrance that say that. Um, but again, we have let everyone know that if it is communicated well ahead of time that, hey, we've got this guy coming in who can't come down the hill with this trailer, um, if they'll communicate with the construction team that there's a potential that we can get them through the site. So we've been we've been trying to work with everybody to make that happen. So is there a window that's like an established window? No, uh, as far as for racetrack rentals. Hey, you mentioned two o'clock, the gate. Opened. Right, oh yes. For race weekends, the, the roadway from Craighead to turn one is open at 2 p.m. They have a temporary fence up that then allows them to just come through the site and the construction team knows that and they pretty much shut down that area. So it's dedicated for that traffic to come in and out. I think what the concern keeps being is for individual track rentals. There's so many of those. We cannot just shut down and have a temporary fence up through the construction site, you know, ready for those people to come in and out. But, and, and there are going to be times where we can't accommodate or shut down progress that's happening in that area to let someone through. But we have said if that individual race team will communicate to the Speedway staff, fairground staff, and let us know, hey, on this day, at this time, we would, could we get this person through? We've, we've said that's a possibility, but to date, that hasn't happened. And we have had people just try to come through the site, and you know, if people just pull on the side, it's, hard, it's tough for us to control that, and that is a safety issue. So, okay. we are 
trying to work with everybody to make sure that progress can continue and that the regulations are followed and we want to accommodate everybody as best as possible. And I ask him, what's the story with it, or do you know the story of this dump truck? Yes, I, I got a phone call. Uh, you know, obviously I, I'm not sitting watching every single uh, truck come, on, come onto the site, but I did get a phone call right as that after that happened. Uh, I was notified and I said, okay, please make sure that the rest of the concrete trucks coming on site. What, the, what actually happened was this guy was a new driver. He had never been to the site before. He showed up down here. He should not have been let onto the site. He ended up being let through the gate. So he went to the wrong place. He was let on the site. You know, we immediately corrected the issue and it hasn't happened again. So, you know, when you've got different people coming from all different trades onto a construction site every now and then, you know, put, someone's going to go to the wrong entrance. Um, so it's unfortunate that happened, that happened, but it's obviously, thankfully, nothing happened that, you know, no one was hurt. I don't think there was a huge safety concern, but uh, obviously it was uh, inconvenient for whoever was standing around when it happened. And we hope that, it, and, you know, our safety team is going to make sure that those types of things do, do not happen in the future. So, okay. I, I wasn't aware of the situation. Jonathan, uh, I've heard something about um, some equipment uh, on the Fair Park job site being tampered with after hours or being damaged. Could you talk about that and let us know if, if, if any more equipment has been tampered with after hours? Uh, yeah, we've had a couple occasions where, uh, where some of our water pumps have been tampered with, turned off or revved all the way up to, uh, to red line to where then they would run dry. Um, and then we've also some of the uh, the UTVs that the construction team used were tampered with. They, someone ripped the ignition out of one. Uh, so we've had a couple incidents like that, but I think since the issue where the ignition of the one uh, machine was ripped out, I don't think we've had anything else happen to my knowledge. Quick question, John. We, we have though, as of this week, actually, um, someone cut over the weekend, cut the chain uh, to the gate on Bransford. So we did have someone come into the site. We don't know why, but we let fairground staff know as well just to make sure, hey, you know, someone came on site, make sure all y'all's equipment and everything is in good shape as well. So that's kind of been, those those things have happened as well. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned the schedule completions end of uh, middle of December. Uh, I was curious about the uh, plan for grass and being that it's kind of end of growing season and are we doing sod or how are we? Right, so they're going, the plan is to start sprigging uh, the north fields this month, uh, probably start hopefully by the middle to end of next week at the latest. Uh, the south fields, the plan is to start sprigging them at the end of June. Um, those, those field areas have to, once they even start growing, at a minimum have to have like five or six months. And if there's somebody sitting right here that knows more of that, but five or six months to get established before you can start driving on them. Uh, Metro Parks would probably say, you need to wait a year. You know, we did the, this, this similar system was used at uh, Send Amphitheater, um, which it's been great. It's been extremely durable. Um, foot traffic is actually, consistent foot traffic is actually more damaging than, than uh, occasional vehicle traffic. Um, but so those fields will, you know, from the time they actually start growing, will not be able to be driven and parked on realistically for another six months from from that point forward, which really puts that in, at the end of the year. Um, you know, you have to protect the what you're investing in the area. Great, thank you. Anybody else? And again, and again, we throughout that time we've had 75 weather impact days, but we're still maintaining the completion mid-December. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, question for Ed about the budget. Yes, sir. Okay. I do want yeah, to address just, cu just curious. I'm, I'm assuming it's because of a, a, just kind of the cash flow. We don't pay out till work is done, but it just seems like there's more work been done than the funds are showing. So I'm just curious how that. Correct. So I, I'll, I had this conversation with Lou, but I'll, I'll be clear. Most of the work, or literally everything park-related debt, Jonathan mentioned is not reflected in what you have there in the budget. Those are parks dollars that are being spent. Um, 
related to, to that work. Um, what you have in front of you is related to work on the fairgrounds and fairgrounds improvements. What you will see reflected um, come next month, so work that's currently taking place, but invoicing has not been received, reviewed, and processed, uh, will be related to the grandstands improvements. Um, so Skanska will be um, compiling an invoice. We'll probably see it in the next couple days here, and by the time you have that report in front of you come the conclusion of June, you will have a reflection of work that's been done through the end of the month of May. Great, thank you. This may be a question for you and Jonathan, but is there a way that we can tally what has been damaged on the property? And if, if um, anything continues to happen, what that number looks like? Yes, uh, as we've been having reports of incidents, we've tracked them all as a log. I am absolutely certain we can assign at least an estimated dollar value to that and present that to you all. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, also under uh, old business, do we have MLS stadium update? The process is continuing. Uh, we are in the final stages of negotiating an agreement with the architectural engineering firm. Purchasing is in the process of um, soliciting construction managers. That should happen. Our goal is to have the A&E firm submitted to the Sports Authority by the 21st of next, which is next week, for their board meeting, and then try to get uh, some definition of the construction managers to their board meeting in July. So that's moving well. Um, so, Mary? From the team perspective, um, we're in the process of working on various agreements with Metro, the lease and development agreement. Um, also wanted to comment that we will enter into a separate agreement with the Fairgrounds Nashville related to items in the lease that specifically relate to the site, such as scheduling other neighborhood related matters and uh, in the process of getting that uh, agreement underway. And just uh, also wanted to mention that, uh, you know, as we work through this design process, as we've said before, you know, we are committed to integrate with all the uses of the fairgrounds, whether it's expo activities, uh, such as Christmas Village or the flea market or racing or other items, as well as um, a fair is working, you know, look forward to working with Laura and her team on that and uh, the neighborhood on various matters there and look forward to this project. Thank you. Okay. Um, new business, where we want to start here. Um, it says election of board officers. So I believe there was a slate of officers that was nominated back in April. Um, and that was a Ned Horton for chair and Aaron McAnally for vice chair. So it is um, actually election of those two uh, positions on the board. So is there a motion to be made? I move. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Do we have any uh, discussions? Reconsiderations, objections, issues? Uh, uh, if none, uh, let's take a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you, folks. A lot of work to do still. All right. Uh, new business merchandise and display policy. So this item was added to the agenda just to have a general discussion on our prohibited items list, which was brought to the board uh, September. I believe it was this past fall of 17, we updated our list. And, and more specifically, um, to talk about uh, racist or culturally insensitive materials. And I wanted to kind of open that up for discussion. Apparently this was um, discussed at length, I think back in uh, 
approximately two years ago uh, before I came, so I thought it warranted uh, a, a, a repeat discussion of, of those, especially that item on the prohibited uh, merchandise list. And I, I've been pushing this uh, because I, we had a discussion, I think, in the, in the fall briefly. Um, um, uh, one of the fall flea markets, there, were, there was a table of materials of signs that were uh, newly manufactured signs that were made to look like they were from the 50s and 60s that were segregationist. And we, we had a discussion about it back then and um, have had more indications from from attendees in recent months that there are um, uh, Confederate materials popping up on site. Um, um, and, and so, um, you know, I've, I've, I know Metro Legal, I think, is still taking a look at it, so I don't think we have anything to have action on today. Um, but, but did want to have a discussion about, about the, this is a problem. Um, you know, the, the, the people the vendors, the very small minority, and it's a very outlying group who, who are bringing these materials and they know what they're doing, uh, they're, they're sneaking them in and, and it's cowardly. Um, they, they know the materials are inappropriate. They know they're racist, um, period. There is no other defense for them. And, um, it, you know, subject to legal advice from Metro Legal, I, I really would like to see us adopt a policy that's very, very much addresses this head on. It needs to stop. Um, this fairgrounds uh, is is for every citizen of this city, and um, and to the fullest extent possible under the law, we need to ban racist materials, and that's what they are, the racist period, and and everybody who loves the fairgrounds being a diverse place that welcomes all citizens should should embrace that policy, and I um, I don't know if any other. Commissioners have any thoughts or anything on that, but uh, you know, and hopefully we can get something to the point where we can get a policy that, that Metro Legal thinks we can um, is is a, is a you know valid policy that we can get before us here as soon as possible on that. Question and clarification from Laura, maybe Mary Ann. I, I thought we were doing, I guess, for sweeps or reviews or tours of the flea market, and if they saw uh, some of these, you know prohibited items, they would give a warning, and then if it came up again, they would be asked to leave. Is that, if we get some clarification, maybe Marianne, about what? If you'll come up, I'll repeat the question. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, but when this came up wait, what, a year and a half ago, two years ago, I thought we, you, you were telling us, I guess, a. I don't know if it's a formal or informal policy, but you, you, you or your staff are doing kind of a reviews, kind of tours of the facilities. If any of these items were either reported or was seen by the staff, you would give warnings to the to the vendor, and if that same vendor had another infraction, they would be asked to leave for a certain amount of time. But maybe I'm not oh, summarizing correct. correctly, but if you could kind of talk through what, what is kind of commonplace today when one of these infractions comes up. The last flea market, I went around myself and all the sheds, all the buildings, and checked. And I had one incident, and the gentleman said, well, you're going against my First Amendment. We have a policy here by the Fair Board that we do not accept these kind of things. Made me a little problem, but he took it down, and I had no more uh, action from him. Since this policy has been in, in, I guess, in place, have you had to ask anyone to leave? No. Uh. -uh. Usually, they will take it down or move whatever merchandise they have. Mainly, say, even though they say it's my First Amendment. Uh -huh. Yeah. Maybe. They have policies here at the fairgrounds by the fair board. Great. If you don't agree, then yes, you, you will leave. Great, thank you. Maybe a clarification from legal, was that within our grounds to ask them to leave? Well, you, you, the board, as, as, as you all have talked about, the board has um, adopted a policy. You are uh, within your rights under um, both of the private acts as well as the charter to adopt policies and procedures or rules that, this, that govern the um, 
activities on the fairgrounds. And consistent with that authority, you have adopted the policy as it relates to uh, the fairgrounds and specifically the flea market. It says prohibited items, no food, drink, or concession items shall be sold at this market without management approval. Um, illegal um, items and then uh, racist or culturally insensitive items, pornographic or explicit sexual materials, stolen or counterfeit items, outdated recalled medication, recalled food or merchandise, drug paraphernalia. Um, those are all the items that you all have listed already in your existing flea market policy. So um, Ms. Marianne's uh, actions are consistent with that policy. Um, Commissioner Bergeron has shared with us a policy that has been adopted by a flea market in the Kentucky area, I believe, and ask that we review that. That policy is under review, and we do anticipate having some advice for the board, but we wanted to, and, and, and we've, we've done some research on it already, but we want to um, just continue to review that and maybe even look at where other policies may have been adopted similarly and have been up, upheld by the courts. Um, so that's kind of where we are in the process right now. Mr. Chairman. How are vendors educated on the uh, prohibited items? They're given a policy, a, a copy of our rules and regulations. Uh, if, if they're there personally, we give it to them. Otherwise, it's online and we ask them, have you read our rules and regulations? Are they required to sign any attestation or anything with no. the contract when they? No. I think that's a really good idea. <clears throat> Might be just something to think about. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. If you don't mind, can we jump to, and I don't know that we have much on this topic, but the final item here is about uh, flea market vendors or different uh, groups, um, membership groups, formation, affiliation, um, somebody that wanted to speak on this or bring this to the table. I think we can just review some of the materials um, that Wanda, I've not seen those, so. Okay. All right, so uh, the next item is recommendations from public engagement and consideration of site plan. <coughs> and maybe now we can yes, uh, um, move to sharing some information. I'll need a quick second just to um, get the presentation queued up, um, but since it's also going to be PowerPoint, we've reserved some seats. If you want to relocate over to the um, front row there, you'll be able to see the presentation a little bit better. Good morning. Um, I'm Kim Hawkins with Hawkins Partners, representing part of the Fairgrounds Master Plan team. And um, pleased to be here with you today. I'm sorry that Gary Gaston with the National Civic Design Center could not be here, who was one of those that was, uh, the Design Center was really facilitating a lot of this public engagement. Um, let me just kind of run through the highlights, uh, the overall schedule over a period from May 17th, really that Thursday, May 17th and 18th, as well as Monday and Tuesday, May 21st and 22nd, there were a series of public engagements that happened uh, on Thursday. There were a couple of open periods for the public to come and share their thoughts on Friday and Monday. There were opportunities for the public to come while there was a design charrette to also continue to offer their feedback. And I would say we had a broad population, uh, represented vendors, it represented normal attendees, it represented the community at large, neighbors from the immediate area, as well as a number of uh, area office workers. So we were really pleased with the cross-section of people uh, that came. 
On May 25th, we had a separate event uh, just for vendors uh, so that we could really get vendor feedback from the flea market. And so that was on Friday, uh, May 25th. And then on May the 29th, we had an overall presentation to the broader community, again, for the overall updated uh, improvement plan. Where we are today is this plan being presented for the fair board's consideration, and then the long term is uh, from June, actually tomorrow is when uh, the SP for uh, the private development is submitted. That would go through a September a planned um, planning commission in September, and then from July through October there will be a series of additional presentations to the fair board, to the sports authority, and uh, Metro Council actions anticipated. So just a little bit about uh, the goal, the whole reason that we did the, the uh, public meetings was really to get feedback and input on uh, one major goal, which is to say, what, what's the status quo? What are the things that we're bringing to the table with this improvement plan? And that includes, one, all of the existing fairgrounds uses. So to be clear, the flea market, the speedway, the state fair, and the expo events. So all of those remaining, as as well as the new fair park that you all know is under construction right now, the MLS soccer stadium, and mixed-use development. So looking at all of those uses for how those might integrate within the community and within the site, and uh, to make sure that it benefits the neighborhood and the broader city. So that team, of course, the fair board is right there in the middle of it, but we also recognize the fair board is collaborating with a number of other entities. So those include Metro Parks. I mentioned the Civic Design Center, which assisted in the facilitation of these public events, uh, Nashville Soccer Holdings, Sports Authority, and of course, Metro Government and the Metro Council. So as we start uh, started talking about the Metro Improvement Plan, one of the ideas that had been uh, suggested from the Fair Board was the idea of how we looked at the idea of moving that Expo Center and the Event Center down to the lower portion of the site. And there was a lot of consideration given for that and a number of goals related to why that would be moved. And those were better access from a, a, a vehicular standpoint as well as pedestrian, I would say. Um, visibility, not just from uh, Nolansville Road, but Craighead, as well as the extension of Wedgwood. Um, certainly one of those considerations that was very critical was that all facilities be a one-for-one -one replacement of existing facilities. Um, that is a very strong goal. The idea of equalizing foot traffic so that there was more exposure for vendors, that they could come from, a, people could come from a variety of locations and there would be great exposure to them. And then certainly the modernization of the facilities. Um, as, as you all know, most of the flea market and expo facilities are in about 12 different buildings right now um, that are uh, not adjoined and, and kind of throughout the site. So the idea of modernizing those facilities and providing some improvements that, um, that might be a real benefit to ben vendors and uh, exhibitors. And so why this location? There are actually a number of reasons. Uh, the first being timing, and this is probably the most important, and we heard a lot of this from uh, flea market vendors and, and exhibitors. Uh, again, Christmas Village was another one. Nobody wants to be closed for a month. This is a really important site for um, the flea market. It's a really important site for a lot of our exhibitors. And so in order to be able to have the Expo Center open all the time and keep it going on the top of the hill, the idea is if the construction is, is able to happen at the bottom of the hill, it allows no one to be closed. So we can completely finish the construction of this new facility and move from the top of the hill to the bottom of the hill without interruption. That was very important and very important to a lot of the vendors. Um, the idea of simultaneous event coordination, again, kind of spreading those facilities out in a couple of different locations gives us the opportunity to have multiple events happening at one time without disruption. And then certainly the lower site does not have the same topography that the, tops, that the site on the top of the hill has, so it actually was resulting in a pretty considerable reduction in construction cost, um, which was, again, a consideration that I think the Fair Board would be interested in. 
So um, going back to those public meetings, we had table, uh, table talk in all of these. We broke into tables, um, and by doing so, we were able to get a lot of feedback. Um, we put all of those different comments together. The Design Center put all of those different comments together and kind of came up with a list here of seven that, were, uh, that we heard again and again at various tables. Number one at the top of the list for the community was accessibility and connectivity. Um, how do we get to the site from a transportation standpoint, from a bicycle standpoint, from a pedestrian standpoint? Um, transportation, parking, traffic flow, and management. Again, critical item that has been raised by everyone, uh, and we're in the midst of, Kimley Horn is in the midst of an overall traffic management and, um, and parking plan right now addressing that. Affordability came up multiple times. Keeping it affordable, this is a very important site um, for our overall community. Green space, open space, less asphalt, so the idea of how do we how do we keep the site and, and bring actually more green space into it? There's a lot of asphalt today. How do we kind of bring a little bit more of um, the open space and green space into the site so that it makes it um, more comfortable for everybody who's here? Uh, respect for the surrounding neighborhood. Of course, we, uh, as I said, we had a lot of neighbors that showed up. Um, there are concerns certainly for noise ordinances and things that have been disruptive over time that are also kind of part of uh, the fabric of the fair board. Safety and security, always a consideration, and it was brought up. And then uh, one thing that I would say every person that I talked to at any of the public meetings had in common was maintaining the flea market and the other existing uses. So I think that, uh, that was talked about again and again. So after the, so the community meetings we had, and then we had, I mentioned to you, we had a separate one that was just for the flea market vendor feedback, and uh, that was on that Friday night. And uh, as you might imagine, some of, those, uh, some of those discussion points are really the same. Certainly the idea of affordability in the case of the flea market vendors, it was related to what vendor expenses were and maintaining the affordability. Another was vendor parking and access. Uh, and, and we really got a lot of good feedback that evening from vendors for how they needed to access the building, what the loading patterns were, uh, where they wanted vendor parking. And I mean, parking is always a big consideration. So the next one is where are customers parking? Is it proximate um, to the center itself? And the idea that we need more customer parking. Um, the other one that we heard again and again was how do we keep the flea market authentic? It's just one of the great things uh, about Nashville is having that flea market and how do we keep it authentic? And then foot traffic. Um, the idea, we heard a lot about that people got worn out and they didn't really have a place to go uh, refresh to be able to come back in and, and kind of continue the shopping experience at the flea market. So um, how do we accommodate that pedestrian foot traffic? How do we give them places to rest so that they can refresh and come back in? And then uh, one of the ideas, this was a great idea that came out of the flea market vendors, was the idea of creating a user advisory committee. And we think that that's an awesome idea as we move forward with the improvement plan, to have a group of user advisors that we can kind of, uh, that the team as a whole can kind of meet with as we go through the process. So um, the draft improvement plan, just a few of those considerations, part of what you see here is uh, not unlike the uh, overall diagram that had been shown um, several weeks ago. But um, this shows the relocated expo buildings. Um, knowing that this entire site is the fairground site with the exception of the mixed use that you see there in blue and the stadium that you see there in gray, um, the rest of the site does all belong to the fairgrounds. The expo buildings are located there in the top, that kind of orange uh, color. And uh, some of those goals that we talked about for the expo buildings that have been incorporated here is the idea that we do have 125,000 square feet of conditioned space 
and 100,000 square feet of covered space. Again, that was part of that goal of having a one-for-one -one replacement. So those are depicted in this plan. There are multiple loading zones. Again, uh, some of these came out of those vendor conversations. Loading zones at the back of the building, but we also have accessibility around the building so that you can have big garage doors that open up so that you can load directly into the floor um, from three sides right now. Um, and that's that X access that's necessary around the building and the idea of having those pull-up doors to provide as much easy accessibility for those vendors as possible. Um, and then green space, the incorporation of some green space and some access then to whether it's to the greenway or to some internal green space. We've also, as I run through the plan, I'll show you, we've also looked at a number of ways that the expo space, exhibit space, can actually extend beyond this site to kind of come up the area that we're referring to as the promenade and into other spaces so that for large events there's the opportunity to expand out. Uh, so the next plan, Go oh, back one, Michelle. Thank you. Um, okay, sorry. Um, the, the other question, and, and you heard that I said it came up numerous times, is what's happening with the parking? How does that work? So again, and I, I've also mentioned that we have uh, a traffic management and parking plan that is underway right now by Kimley Horn. It is not complete, but the information that we have compiled so far addresses a number of those issues. Um, so we currently have on this plan, um, about 1,300 surface parking spaces. Some of those happen, uh, they happen on both sides of where the Expo building is, on the north side, as well as in a number of lots that are on the, on the south side, on, on the hill. Um, 1,300 there, about 240 fair park permanent parking spaces. Those are the parking spaces that are right along Craighead that um, are next to the dog park and kind of where those restroom facilities are. There are another 1,300 parking spaces spaces at Fair Park, and those are the ones that you see in the light blue here that would be temporary parking spaces. Those are able to be used for um, major events, and that is because, as Jonathan was describing, the process of the fields are um, have a fiber-reinforced turf that allow for parking to happen on them occasionally. We've identified approximately 1,200 uh, parking spaces that may fit within the Speedway area. That again came out of community meetings. We heard it from the community several times saying, why, why can't we use that? And we thought that seemed like a really good idea. And it provided another 1,200 spaces in very close proximity to the Expo Center. Um, and 1,600 shared parking spaces are located within the mixed use. And again, those are the blue blocks that you see right there. And then additional surrounding parking, that might be at 50 Forward, at Fall Hamilton School, um, a number of different locations uh, in the area. I also want to mention that as we've looked at this, we've also, uh, RV parking is important. Um, we heard that, again, a lot from the flea market vendors. And so we've also identified on this plan a couple of locations that we feel like become good opportunities for RVs to be able to park so that they are proximate to the Expo Center, but they're a little bit removed. They're not like right there next to it. And so um, there is a small lot on the upper left corner that might accommodate RVs, and then the other, an, another lot that's kind of a triangular shape right now between the stadium and the speedway that we feel like provides a really good location for RVs. Again, just knowing that we're thinking about that as we kind of go through the process. And then for the mixed use, um, the mixed use development team has looked at opportunities for how those blocks might get a little bit more um, defined uh, configuration. And those three blocks at total 10 acres are shown here. And the variety, one of the questions uh, that we had from the community is what uses might be there. And they had a lot of ideas, I will say. The community had a lot of ideas on things that they wanted to be there. At the top of their list were sit down and fast casual restaurants and the idea that whatever happens at the mixed use was actually working with some of our permanent fairgrounds uses like flea markets like speedways etc so sit down and fast casual restaurants were really important to them uh, retail shops and neighborhood services again this is something that was high on the list of the neighborhood and um, 
and is, is listed in the potential uh, uses named by the mixed use development team. Uh, entertainment venues, mixed income residential, uh, again, getting back to the affordability uh, that was cited by uh, community members and in the public meetings and is incorporated here, creative office space and the potential of a hotel. And again, within that mixed use uh, area, identified about 1,600 spaces that might be used for parking. And so with that, um, that is the report of the improvement plan and where we are today. And going back to that schedule, the mixed use applies for its preliminary SP tomorrow with an expected um, time period of September for that uh, rezoning. And then the other uh, processes with the Fair Board, Sports Authority, and Council uh, through July through October. I think she's got another meeting, got but here. Ron's here. Ron's here. Okay. I might have a few questions. I don't if Kim has to leave, but. Ron up. Mm -hmm. Maybe Ron. Yeah. Own is up on that. Somebody's phone or something. It's been there for a while. <laughs> okay. Oh, had a meeting she had to attend to, so she. Okay. This is Michelle Scoble. I think I've met her, but. Hi, Michelle. Now, one thing I, I wanted to ask if there were. Uh, no, I guess a, a lot of this team went in with. Uh, open eyes or a clean slate because you hadn't been involved in any of the discussions that have been going on here for years, but were there any um, surprises from any of the meetings that, that uh, you would identify? Uh, well, I mean, I think that I, I was delighted by the uh, public engagement and the people who had their various interests. As you well know, there's a lot of different uh, focuses out there. and. Uh, each one had a, had some good ideas, and so I think we were delighted by that. Uh, the process was very intense, uh, and but by bringing everybody together, not only the not only the public, but also the various design teams that are working on different components, uh, we were able to get a consensus rather quickly, and I think we got a, a clear direction. So I'm not sure that answers your question, but that's that's kind of the process we're going through. One thing that I don't uh, know, I don't see him here today, but we have a, 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 a current racetrack operator, racetrack promoter, uh, Mr. Tony Formosa. Did you folks speak with him during the process? We, we've not directly. Of course, anybody was invited to come and attend all the public meetings, but we are going to sit down with him and review that. Uh, in detail relating to some of his specifics. Yeah, I, I have met with Tony individually several times um, and walked them through both him and Claire, and we will continue to do that. We're actually um, going to be <clears throat> identifying a group of racers uh, to sit down and, and talk to um, as we continue our very uh, more specific and community engagement. Uh, so we wanted to meet with specific groups, and he's gonna help facilitate that for us. One of the things I, I found, I mean, I like out-of-the-box creative ideas. One of the things that came up was parking in this in Speedway. I'm surprised we've never, that's never been brought up before, or I never thought of it. But I happened to be at the uh, Friday night meeting where the um, focus with the flea market vendors, and that was discussion was going on, and I, I did see Tony there, and I went to chat with him. It was 
concerned what he would think about it. And he was seemed to be totally fine with it. Um, he seemed to be very upbeat about improvements to the facility and not just the, the speedway, but the, the grounds in general and the, the fact that new uh, people that hadn't been using the facility, like the dog park or other, other people would be coming here, seeing what's going on and maybe be, uh, become fans of the speedway or become fans of the flea market. Um, and so he, he was very upbeat, so that, that was, I, I was pleased to hear that. I was a little concerned that even the concept of parking in that speedway would, would raise, uh, but I mean, long down the road to be determined, but that, I thought that was kind of a creative idea that I don't know who came up with it. But Very creative. And yeah. uh, that was done before we got on board. People started mentioning that and uh, I think that's an excellent idea. We've got to work through some of the access points and those kind of things. The other thing is with the promenade that Kim mentioned and the way to progress up the hill in a more gradual climb uh, than what we have today is going to accent a new entrance to the speedway that's kind of a bonus of this whole concept. And looking at things we can do to highlight that entrance. Uh, and as you come up, you're going to be able to see in the speedway, you'll be able to get in and out easier. So uh, that's an exciting component as well. We heard from a lot of uh, folks who came to the community, you know, they wanted to have other things to do. You might come for a flea market, but stay on site for Fair Park, for the dog park, or stay on site for the restaurants that are going to be there. So there were some items that would keep people on site um, and give give more options. And so I think that was something that uh, did come out of those community meetings where you would um, be on site, but your eyes are open to all the different uses that are there. And so it would encourage more people to use options there at the site. I will mention too in the, um, when Ron referenced the accessibility um, in that area near the Speedway, if you take Benton Avenue in, in the um, site plan, looking at connecting Benton Avenue through a long sweeping arch uh, to Wedgwood Road, uh, Wedgwood Avenue extended, what that allows us to do is to reduce that grade uh, from the lower area of the property to the hill to a 5% grade, which makes it um, ADA accessible and much easier for pedestrian traffic to get from the lower site to the upper site with strollers, scooters, wheelchairs, et cetera. Uh, one thing um, we heard is a concern that, oh, this is the, you're building in a flood zone. So could you address that? Sure. Um, right now, uh, on the plan in, before you, you should be able to see where the flood way is along Browns Creek. There's actually a 75-foot buffer extended to that that is um, a, a no-build zone. And so there's no construction, no building that will be happening or, or parking that's being proposed, new parking that's being proposed in that area. So we're staying out of that flood way as well as the 75-foot buffer. And that is... Um, meeting the approvals of Metro Water Services. Okay. How do the number of uh, parking spots compare to current? Um, roughly there's about 6,000, a little more than 6,000 proposed if you're able to use all the temporary uses. Laura, I think you can correct us if we're wrong, but right now there's about 5,000 or so parking spots. It, it, it's very comparable um, with the addition of the uh, shared parking that could happen with the mixed use, the 1,600 uh, that's proposed in the mixed use area. Mm -hmm. I think Kim mentioned this. Kimberly Horn is doing a detailed traffic and parking study, and they're ramping that up, and they'll be back to present in a month or so, maybe a couple of months. But uh, we'll, we'll be able to get into the parking in detail when that report's done. Does, does the site plan have any assumptions? Um, and it, it may, maybe it doesn't. It, that's not something for this. But does the site plan have any, make any assumptions about what's going to happen at the Rains and Wedgwood intersection? Any, any changes to that intersection at all? Well, Wedgwood uh, at this time is proposed to straighten and extend out to Craighead from that point on. So Wedgwood itself will change gra 
drastically from Walsh Avenue. It will likely be multiple lanes, you know, proposing three to four bike lanes, uh, have much better pedestrian access. Um, right now, I think that's 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 what's being proposed. And again, Ron mentioned that Kimley Horn is also involved on the traffic study. They've been in for, I think, about three weeks now. So I think they're still working on making sure that those intersections are exactly the way that they should be. And we're looking at rains becoming a pedestrian access from the neighborhood that would feed through the mixed use up to the soccer area as well. So that that is what we're looking at. All of these issues have a lot of detail engineering that's going to need to take place that will tweak them at some point. But <clears throat> to answer your question, yes, that intersection will be looked at. So will the profile of all the new roads and what what kind of uh, configuration we'll have, the number of lanes, bike lanes, landscaping, et cetera, will all be plugged into that. And so that, uh, and that's all going to kind of rely a lot on that $25 million in infrastructure funds that's included as part of this package is, is going to really go a long way to, to this really important infrastructure work. Yeah. yeah, that's all infrastructure, so we'll yeah. have to sort that out. Yeah. Okay. I had a question or just an observation. Looking at the northeast corner of it, the Knowlesville Wingrove uh, section, uh, you know, across the street there is the, uh, excuse me, sorry, my mic was off. The, across the street there is that, uh, I guess, flood, flood area, metro property, you know, that depending on traffic uh, or transit plans, you know, maybe a potential site one day or even overflow parking or potential use. But so I want to ask to keep that in mind for pedestrian access on that corner because it didn't look like there's a lot of connectivity there. So just think through that. Question. Um, you know, we do, we are looking at Windro Windgrove and how that connects into Nolansville and how um, having the surface parking on the north side of the expo would you know, make sure that that street is still effective and works and um, it, there may need to be some slight improvements to it as part of that infrastructure plan. So we're looking at that. That's a great suggestion. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that Kim said she's talked to all the current users about the expo building design, but I just think um, there will be a lot of new users, whether it's, you know, local schools looking for you know, graduation space or um, family reunions, but I also think a lot of out-of-town groups will, will want to use that space. How are you making sure that you incorporate those voices into, like, to making sure that we meet their needs? The space is being designed uh, to be flexible because there are so many different uses currently on site, um, and, and with the... Um, I guess the, the future is bright for what could be used there. And so it's very important in that 125,000 square feet of conditioned space that it is a, a, lot, a lot of flexibility so that you could set things up for smaller events, medium events, or larger events. Are y'all talking to some convention planners who sort of need this overflow space if they can't fit into Music City, everything in, at Music City Center, that sort of thing? We're not, we haven't yet, but that's on the list. Mm -hmm. and, and we're going to be working on a essentially working on the building and getting a little bit more into the specifics of that in the next few months. In which case we'll be talking with them, talking to uh, lessons learned at Music City Center and other places, <clears throat> as well as surrounding counties, which have these kind of facilities. Uh, and understanding that the more we can use this facility, the better it will be for everybody. Uh, again, I think Michelle mentioned right now the key is flexibility. At the same time, working with uh, the market advisory group and some of the others to maintain the intimacy of what they have in some of their facilities today. And uh, so it's going to be a challenge, but I think it's we're building from ground up. It's going to be custom, and uh, I think we can meet those challenges. And our, the next few months is going to be trying to articulate that in such a way that uh, we've got a functional building. Um, I was just told over here um, by, by Ed that um, 
prior to our time on this project, uh, there has been some collaboration with Music City Center and to talk about the different options for conventions. So. Yeah. Yeah, we have, uh, we took a, a tour of MCC just to get, you know, again, what works, what would you do differently, you know, five years out, um, some considerations there, lessons learned, um, but also I have met with several meeting planners, um, most recently Destination Nashville, and I, I just read that there is another major event company coming into town and, and we'll be setting up meetings with them as well. We want to be on the radar screen. I mean, that's kind of our point is, is have people consider the fairgrounds as to host their meeting. Regarding um, the, the parking uh, lot uh, that's on the north side um, of the expo buildings uh, closest to Wingrove, my understanding is that, that that layout would be conducive to a potential future parking facility going up from that lot. Have you, that, that's that's possible in that site plan down the road, correct? There, there's a placeholder for that, for a, you know, a one-level structured lot um, that, that could be built in the future to okay. extend that parking. Anybody else? Okay, we appreciate it. Thank you. I think we have uh, some deadlines to consider. Um, there's a lot of other parties, uh, Metro Council, um, that needs to be involved in a lot of steps here. Um, sure there'll be a lot more public uh, meetings, um, whether it's as the plans for this exposition space unfold or different parts of uh, property here. But, um, you know, we, we've adjusted and, and there's been a lot of questions about how, how we continue um, which is our goal, to continue with the current uses and, and give them better facilities with construction plans, with um, out disrupting events that we're, we're already committed to. So this, this idea of utilizing the, the vast property that we have there at the end of Wedgwood um, seem to make a lot of sense, um, just not being an architect or anything else, but just, uh, you know, I live in the area, I've lived here since 1996, I live right off of Wedgwood, coming down Wedgwood with a, with a nice entrance and you can go right in, um, and we have, we have a budget that's been set aside, we have um, goals we want to do, we want to provide new, more efficient buildings more efficient in so many ways with, a, with the opportunity to design these new facilities. Um, so, you know, we want to kind of get to work. And it, it made a lot of sense to look at this, and so we've looked at it and engaged the public. Um, you know, there's going to be a lot of people that don't like any change. Uh, there are people that, are, you, you know, object to certain parts of this, but we're tr we can't make everybody happy all the time, but I think we do have a charge to move forward in improving this facility. Um, I know I've personally talked to a lot of our exhibitors and our f flea vendor uh, exhibitors, uh, Christmas Village, multiple times, and they're very concerned about disrupting their business. They're very concerned about what the pricing will be of booths and parking and the other things that we currently operate. But we do have a, a a, a long history here um, of doing a wide range of things. Um, 51 years ago, there was not a flea market, um, but it's become an integral part of what we do here, and we want to 
build something that's going to last for at least the next 50 years uh, to be efficient to modern standards, to look at how things are working, how they could made maybe made a little bit better, but not disrupt uh, what is working for, for so many, the unique nature of the flea market as it's unfolded here organically. Um, and there'll be other things that come down the road that uh, this property, there'll be folks with their dogs here, I look forward to that, um, that, that will be invited to uh, use this property where before it was just a, a parking lot or we parked school buses or we uh, had unused buildings or stored uh, voting machines or whatever. So I, I, I think we have to take this one little bite at a time. And what I see, what we need to do, we've got feedback. The feedback is very positive. One of the things that I don't think was clear, we talked about saving money by building on the flat area. Well, really, we have a budget to work with. It, we can do more with that budget. It's not like we're cutting back or scrimping, trying to scrimp on the facility for the uh, exhibition center. It gives us the ability to think a little bit bigger. We got a little bit more that we're not having to move things around on top of a hill, uh, work around other uh, operations and work around um, people and buildings that are still in, in, in place. I mean, uh, sheds, I mean, this place is just, I don't think with a lot of forethought, these sheds and things were dropped here over the course of time. We have the opportunity to rethink this right now. And these meetings, um, I thought were very productive. Uh, there will be more of them, I'm very sure. Um, there are a lot of other parties <laughs> in this mix that uh, have a vested interest, but particularly the citizens of the of, of Metro Nashville. So I think we need to take some action so that we can, uh, the way I look at it is kind of compartmentalize. Uh, right now, I mean, what we have the purview to do is, is move forward with our, taking care of our operation, taking care of our, uh, you know, important customers, both the folks that come here for events and the folks that put on these events and promote these events and rent booth space here and sell things here. Um, so I'd like to see a motion from the board to speak to the thought of building our new buildings, building our new re-envisioned exposition center uh, to the north side of the speedway to the, at the end of Wedgwood. And, you know, again, there's a lot of I's to be dotted, T's to be crossed, and a lot of plans, to, but we saw how this could look, um, why this could work well, how this could work well, and we have to get started. Um, and I think it's, today's the time to, within our, our authority, to move, move the ball forward on this concept of building here. Mr. Chairman, just for, for purposes of kind of bringing us to that point so we can discuss it within the within the purview of a, of a motion, I'll make a motion um, and then maybe we can have some discussion with a, with a motion pending. Um, so so what I'm going to, I'm going to move approval of the um, fairground site plan as presented, um, contingent upon future approvals and or acceptable agreements that may be required by the Board of Fair Commissioners, the Sports Authority, and the Metro Council, um, and also hereby authorize the Executive Director and uh, the Chairman of the Fair Board to approve final site plan details um, with the understanding that there may be shifts within the designated blocks of buildings as construction and topography may necessitate. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, anybody have any thoughts on that and some discussion? Jason, just to clarify, um, does that language give um, the project managers flexibility? Like, we, we still don't have the traffic study, and that sort of thing. Well, and so that's why, you know, it, it, I think that there's, there's certain contingencies in there that are important. A, uh, contingent upon future approvals of, of and agreements of other bodies. I mean, we've got... You know, Metro Council has to see this. You know, uh, uh, sports has to see this. Agreements have to get done. Um, you know, I think it's. I, I want to commend Miss um, Kavara for. for uh, there's been discussions about the importance of the fair board being in in the mix on this, and 
Um, I think that the, this, the, I really appreciate that the team has stepped up with uh, willingness to enter an agreement with the Fair Board directly. It's going to govern a lot of considerations and help everybody, all the stakeholders come together. I think it's going to be vital, and I really appreciate the team stepping up in that regard. Um, but that agreement, like a lot of other things, aren't done, so we have that contingency. But I think there's also flexibility as to some final site plan details to be uh, discussed further. I think what we're looking at here is an overall framework, um, you know, and we have we have the ability to to recognize that this is a difficult process because there are so many moving pieces. We have to take some action that's firm enough that we we've taken a look at the site plan overall. But but there are still some questions to come back, and and you know. With, we may need to have further discussion if some of those contingencies aren't resolved to our satisfaction. But we, this is the first step before a lot of other steps that are going to happen over the next few months. Speak, speaking of those steps, uh, Laura, do you have any, uh, from talking with Metro Legal and the other stakeholders, do you have any kind of high level concepts of what kind of steps need to fall into place in terms of our actions, council? Agreements and still a little too early. It is for specific dates. You know, as Kim mentioned, the rezoning package is going in this week um, for that process to start. Um, as you know, there are several votes that need to happen. Uh, as, as Jason mentioned, you know, operational lease, ground lease. Um, before council, of course, they have to uh, have approval. We have to have approval before any demolition is done on the site. So that vote, uh, seat tax, of course, rezoning is mentioned. Um, I know I'm missing one. So, so there, yes, yes. There, there's a lot. So, you know, as presented in the, in the presentation, the general blocks of time, you know, July to I believe it was October, um, moving those packages forward, getting those documents prepared, and getting them in front of you in ample time for review, as well as the Sports Authority Board of Directors. Great. Thank you for that summary. I think it's, it's <coughs> worth re-mentioning that it's, you know, this is one step in a series of multiple steps that have, will have more input, input from stakeholders, from public, uh, more listening sessions, and, and more opportunities to engage. And um, I definitely want to push back on some earlier comments that were mentioned in, in public comments that this was, you know, thrown together. I think this has uh, been an exceptional process. It's been many years in the making. I mean, essentially, we've started, you know, this process of the new fairgrounds, you know, the, the I forget the name, but the master plans that were, multiple master plans that were discussed many years ago, and this has been discussed, uh, you know, frequently from, from this board uh, for the past, you know, few years, so. Um, I think it's a nice culmination of that, and uh, you know, appreciate the the input from public stakeholders and all the work uh, that, that's gone uh, to, into this, and will continue to go into this. Yeah, I think you know we have we have our operation. We we are in the flea market business at this point, um, and have been for quite a while. Um, we were in the running the state fair business for a long time. That was taken away from us. Um, but I can tell you this, we will stay in the fair, running a fair business. Uh, we'll get back in the running a fair business. Um, I don't know what we'll call it if uh, we don't own the name Tennessee State Fair and if they choose to leave. But we will have fairs here. We will have a fair and we will run it ourselves uh, if if Nobody the legislature wants to chooses to go another way, I mean, legislature's so, always welcome. Still, I renew my monthly call. I'd love to see the legislature show up. Where are they? Yeah, we can but put it, a chair out for them every month. If we want them to show up, but they don't. They never seem to show up. There's a little bit of press here. Maybe they can have a chat with the legislature and see if they want to come have a chat about the state fair. They're always welcome. But I, I, I came to this this board. We were running the fair and been running uh, the fair for decades and decades and decades, uh, over a hundred years. Um, so. Um, we can run a fair. We we know how to do it. We can we can run a, a flea market. We can run a fair. There's a lot of things we can do here. Um, we have some tired buildings and some rundown sheds and some other things that need to be rethought. And we have some budget and some some marching orders to get going to take care of our customers. Um, 
so I see this as a bit of a, this is a necessary step, get going, taking care of ourselves, which is getting new buildings going. Uh, and a lot of work to do, a lot of designing, a lot of communication, a lot of approvals, a lot of things yet to do, but we got to get started. Um, and so the point here, if we can move forward, um, you know, with our, uh, within our authority to begin planning to build our new buildings at this property, um, I think that's step one. And I think this motion, in my opinion, unless legal has something to add to that, covers it for me. Anybody else has any thoughts on it or if we're ready to vote? I do just <clears throat> want to make sure that, that it is understood that due to timing considerations with the um, expo space is that we will proceed with, with designing of these new facilities if voted um, in the affirmative today uh, to get to work through those design details. So we will proceed with that if, if approved. Yeah, we heard <clears throat> the unique character of the fairgrounds, the unique character of the vendors, the unique character of uh, our customers and our citizens here that, um, so I think th those are things people want to see in the design and the, uh, you know, the execution of that design, so. Get a quick recap from either Laura or Metro Legal about the other items that will come back before the board that we'll need to vote on, on this before it's end. I'll like refer to this. Like the operating the agreement. Soccer right. holder. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, well, as, as mentioned with the team, we will be entering into a contractual relationship with the team in regards to operation. Uh, that certainly will, will come before you. Um, the ground lease for the mixed use. I'm correct on that, and then the uh, ground lease with the sports authority. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot yet to be done. Um, we'll have an opportunity to look again at this plus or minus 10 acres. Uh, this approval today does not. If we're approving the ground lease, we'll have more of a chance to know. I mean, the, um, this list of potential use has been the same for the last year and a half, so we don't really have much more detail about that, right? Um, Unless they want to. No, I mean, I, I, I can just give you my opinion. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot more that comes into play before all that gets finalized, and I think Metro Council and others probably uh, log in, but I think I, our business here, the, the uh, if you will, I mean, we're uh, we're charged with taking care of what operations we have here, the current uses. Um, so I think moving forward today uh, helps us plan for a new future for exhibition space and our and our current uses so that's I mean, I, step one I see this I mean I see this motion as having those contingencies I mean I think we we, we are still going to get several more touches on those details and and to that the, the motion is definitely made with that contingency in mind and, and the ability for us to stay you know uh, but we don't have involved. sleeping sweeping global think, approval on it you know I mean I think but I think uh, we the also, rest of these we, there's also contingencies on certain things that need to come back to us and to the just making if my motion didn't already do it that's I'm putting it on the record that's the expectation here and obviously we'll uh, I think we're going to we'll get the, the further detail we need, but from an overall site plan perspective, that's the next step, and I think that that's the intent of of this approval today. Subject to those other items that are still to come, that's certainly my intent. Would anyone like to speak to maybe what's going to be presented tomorrow in regards to? Yes, it's me. <laughs> uh, I mean, they're going to be presenting concepts where to be located and how you'll get acts how you'll be accessing it there's further conversations going on actually today with city count our councilman and some other things about 
scale and that sort of thing. Um, the main thing is is that there's three blocks that roughly 10 acres or less that uh, that are being reviewed, and we're trying to work through those details. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. To the extent that it is, um, may be helpful for the board, um, and to add to what Mr. Gobble has said, um, just so that the board has kind of a framework of how maybe this this approval can be looked at. Uh, typically, I represent the Planning Commission as well, and uh, it's not uncommon for the Planning Commission to approve what is essentially a concept plan, just to get something going and give the Commission a general concept of the direction in which the construction is likely to go and what the plan is to the extent that it can be fleshed out at present. Then there's a need sometimes to come back with a final site plan with all the details that are uh, encompassed, um, which take into consideration topography, real uh, construction uh, barriers and challenges that may have to be overcome, and various other kinds of things. So this is akin, it's not a, a concept plan per se, but it's akin to that idea. Um, so I hope that gives the board some, some thoughts about how to consider this plan and with an understanding that there are going to be some details that may need to be worked out. I agree with Commissioner Bergeron that his uh, motion encompasses that idea and the idea that the chair and the executive director will be authorized to make some um, decisions with regard to um, location and, and uh, tweaks. I don't want to say location because location is really identified in your concept plan, but uh, some tweaks as it relates to addressing topography and uh, real life construction issues that come up. And it's routinely that those come up, in, and particularly in large scale development like this. So I just wanted to share that with you all from that, from both the fair board perspective as well as attorney for the planning commission's perspective and to echo Mr. Gobble's comments. <clears throat> That's exactly right. And, you know, we're going to have three different design teams working feverishly through the next three months if this is approved. <clears throat> one is on your facilities and the exhibition area. Uh, the other one would be the mixed use, and the third would be the stadium. Uh, all of that's got to fit together. And, and we've got to make sure that works. So we've got to develop them kind of at the same time. Uh, so that we do know what those technical issues that we may and we may have with traffic or utilities or topography or any of the other things that we'll get into uh, as we go through this process. So uh, that's what we're looking to do is to keep get yours up and running. The mixed use people are <clears throat> they've got their team together and the stadium is working on putting their team together. So. Um, yes. I don't. I don't think we can take public comments right. during right. A, during board consideration. I, with all due respect yes, to, I, I, that's, I don't think that's proper. And I mentioned legal. I think I would ask. I don't think that's a. Or, this isn't a public hearing in that regard. Yeah. I, again, I think. There's so much yet to be done, and I think a lot of this will be very, um, there'll, there'll be a lot of meetings and a lot of uh, room for input, um, but we have to get started with a general, as you said, concept plan, but, um, and the concept here is we, we have a certain operation that we're take, taking care of, and we're building new facilities for that operation. And we've identified a, a location to continue uh, studying how it would evolve there and how that would look and what we can do with our budget um, and the various approvals throughout the levels of government that will continue to have to <laughs> review this. And, and uh, But looking at our, at our operation, how we best serve what we have going on with new, new facilities, I think this is a... Uh, uh, a really solid plan and gives, allows us to maximize um, what we've been tasked to do with a, with a, within a certain budget range. So, any other discussion or any, everybody feels we're ready for a vote on it? 
maybe we could read it one more time. Um, the motion was to approve the fairground site plan as presented, contingent upon future approvals and or acceptable agreements um, required by the Board of Fair Commissioners, the Sports Authority, and the Metro Council. Um, and also to uh, hereby authorize the executive director and the chairman of the fair board to approve final site plan details with the understanding that there may be shifts within the design blocks as building construction and topography may necessitate. Okay. Any other comments? Questions? We ready for a vote? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Anybody abstain? No? Okay. All right, that motion passes. Uh, a lot to do with that. But um, we move forward, and I think uh, some ex <laughs> exciting plans can unfold for the exhibition space and, and what we can do there. I look forward to hearing more about that. I just want to make mention of one thing. Um, Jonathan is going to be leaving us, and I just wanted to thank him for all his work over the last um, 20 months, I guess. Um, Jonathan is moving on, and I want to congratulate him, too. Uh, he's been accepted into officer school with the Army. So we'll miss him, and thank you so much for all the work that you've done. All right, any further business before the board? We, we didn't really have much on that at this point in time, but maybe we'll bring it back next month. Yeah. Motion we adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.